Hello, I'm George Thompson, president of the Selecty Center for Leadership and School Reform. We're headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky, and for the past 10 years, we have been honored to facilitate the Superintendent's Leadership Network. As we go into our 10th year, we have entered into a partnership with Cisco to expand this network to a national audience. In fact, as I speak, the Superintendent's Leadership Network is having its April Institute at the Cisco headquarters here in San Jose, California. As a part of this experience, Cisco has afforded us an opportunity for a video of a panel presentation which I will facilitate today. The purpose of the panel presentation is to have a conversation about what we have learned about learning from business. At Selecty Center, we frequently facilitate conferences and learning opportunities, and often we go into different kinds of organizations, including business. And we have always framed that experience around the question, what can we learn from this organization, as opposed to what advice does this business have regarding the way we should lead our schools? So we always try to create an experience, if you will, where the superintendents or other audiences have the opportunity to interact with leaders of various kinds of organizations, and then we bring them back and debrief using Selecty Center frameworks as a filter and a way to have conversations about culture, about structure, about core business, and about how resources are allocated and used. Today, we have the pleasure of talking with three individuals. One is Philip Slechty, the founder and CEO of the Slechty Center. The others are Superintendents Annie Wimbish, who is in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, a district which is a partner with Cisco in their 21st Century Schools Initiative, and Steve McCammon, Superintendent in the Fife School District outside of Tacoma, Washington. Phil, I'll start with you. Tell me more about what you mean when you say we can learn from business, particularly when you talk about the difference between learning from as opposed to learning that. What do you mean by that? Well, let me just give a little background. I've always been a student of the literature on business. I studied people like Peter Drucker. And I knew there's a lot to learn from business. And I'm concerned about education. So I've learned a lot from Peter Drucker, for example, that I've applied to schools. Well, I asked myself the question, why couldn't we do that by going to business and asking them these questions? But initially, I made a lot of mistakes because I'd go to business and ask, ask them to teach us about what we could do about our schools. And they weren't reluctant to do that. But the trouble was that quite often the answers we got weren't very helpful. Then I said, now wait, maybe I'm asking the wrong question. Maybe what we ought to be asking business to talk about is how they do their business and then we give educators a chance to learn from that as opposed to asking them to give us advice about how we should do our business have them talk to us about how they do their business and then we can t say now this is their storyline what can we learn from that story and I begin to treat business as a metaphor and over the years that we've worked together I just found it a very powerful tool and we have learned an awful lot that's very very useful not by asking business how to run the schools but asking business leaders how they run their businesses. Now, the lessons haven't always been happy lessons, but they've been important lessons. Right. Could you give me an example? Could you give us an example of perhaps a lesson we've learned from that uh, type of uh, experience for superintendents? Well, uh, one of the lessons I've, I've learned is that there's, there's businesses that are run like Cisco's run, which I'd call them the new businesses. And then there's the old line businesses that grew out of the 1920s and 1930s where the primary business was, was routinizing uh, pr management pro or production processes. And the styles of management that are appropriate to running a factory in the old factory system is very different than the styles of management and the styles of leadership that are appropriate to running a place like Cisco. And so the 21st century is going to be made up of businesses managed like Cisco is managed and the 19th and 20th century is managed uh, like some of the old line heavy industries that are closing down in the Midwest were managed. And if you ask the old line people how to run the schools, they'll tell you to run them the way the schools have always been run, which has been the old model that we've had, as opposed to run them the way that some of the new line businesses are being run. Steve uh, McCammon, are there some examples of lessons that you've learned from some of these experiences, particularly pick up, if you will, on, Steve's, on uh, Phil's former point about old line business and new line business? Well, I, I would say that probably the most compelling point I learned today was a little bit of a reinforcement of what we've learned a lot in working with uh, the Schlechty Center over the years. And that is, uh, 
in my role as being a superintendent, my, my main job, I believe, is to provide capacity. And one of the things I heard really strongly today from Cisco was that this was a, a nice little term that branding makes selling easier. And one of the, I think, toughest jobs in, in a superintendent's world is to make sure that the board understands what its role is and what it is that it advocates for. And as we come up with what our branding is, we call ours, for instance, the Fife Way, and it's about what we're about in, in this work. And I think the more we can give our board to sell to our different communities, then I think that makes the job of the superintendent so much easier to go about the job that we have to do in order for the organization to move forward. Annie, could you give me an example of perhaps a lesson? Um, I'm going to pull on what uh, Phil talked about again about the old line business and the new line business by looking at the collaboration. One of the things that I've learned from the Cisco process is that uh, when they came in to work with us as partners, they literally came in, they brought in fellows, they actually demonstrated working together as a team and guided us in that process and it just m reflected so strongly on how we're still operating in the old line business in our school. You have classrooms, you have teachers working separately, you have people working again preparing students for that old factory mentality whereas really we need to be teaching them more about how to collaborate and work together uh, the one of the major skills that 21st century businesses are looking for so that that's been a major eye-opener for us as a reflection of what we're doing compared to what we need to do when we look at how Cisco is doing things Phil, <clears throat> what can you learn about the culture of a business or the structure of a business and and transfer that back to a school setting well, I think if you if you take a look at well-run modern businesses, the thing that holds them together is a very clear set of common commitments. They put an awful lot of, of attention, uh, give a lot of attention to recruitment and induction systems. Uh, in the in a, a more bureaucratically managed system, you tend to you get you get quality through inspecting lack of quality out. In a in a well-run business. Uh, of the 21st century, you do it by building quality in, by recruiting people and inducting them to knowing what uh, he meant, Steve mentioned, the Fife Way, mm -hmm. knowing what the Fife Way is, and therefore people begin to internalize the norms and internalize the values, and you get a lot more self-supervision as opposed to having to have an external supervisor or an inspector. Uh, and that's that's one of the fundamental differences. And our schools are kind of they're kind of government bureaucracies in some ways. They're becoming more of that. And to, so therefore, what you do instead of building quality in, you try to inspect lack of quality out. And you're never going to get high quality that way. Could uh, either of you give an example, perhaps, of how you've uh, taken what you've learned from business and built it into your recruitment and induction processes mm -hmm. in the school district? Yeah, I've heard Phil say an awful lot that uh, if you don't do the job of inducting mm -hmm. your employees, there are folks there who will. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the things that, that I know we've, we've learned a great deal um, in working this work is, um, you know, you hear Phil talk an awful lot about, uh, and businesses talk a lot about marketing. One of the things I learned really, really recently from Phil and reinforced today from Cisco is that whole notion of uh, testimonial. The whole notion of, it's one thing for me as the leader to say it should be so. It's another thing to take those folks throughout the organization and bring them in and talk about what's working in organization. What is important? Are we walking the talk? I recently took Phil's advice and went back and asked folks in my organization to respond to that question that we could present to our community. And the message coming from them was, was so much more powerful. Uh, that whole notion of, uh, of marketing what's working in our district, I think, has been critical to our success recently. Annie? One of the things that uh, Phil promotes tremendously, he talks about what are your beliefs? You have to have your own beliefs. What's your vision? And part of the induction uh, piece that we've worked with is, first of all, recognizing what our own beliefs are and making sure that others share that belief. And even as you are looking at employees coming in, what are their beliefs? Do they have that shared belief? Mm -hmm. And then making some really courageous and some appropriate decisions, even before you have to go to the induction parties, uh, bringing them on board to start with. And then once they are part of the team, again, going with the Fife way, or the Wimbish way, or whatever way it happens to be, mm -hmm. making sure that you continue to promote that shared vision throughout the process. Thank you very much. Uh, Steve, you mentioned several times about our experience here today at Cisco and it has been a very rich experience that Cisco provided for the superintendents and one of, of the aspects of the uh, program today had to do with 
some sharing of the knowledge development and transmission system here at Cisco, how in a company with 100,000 plus uh, staff members, that what one person learns can be shared with everyone in the organization. So, Phil, you've written about knowledge development and transmission system in your writings, and uh, you had the opportunity to hear that presentation. Any uh, connections that you made that you think have implications for how schools perhaps could improve based on what you heard? Well, I think I think an awful lot of you know electronic networking is lacking. For example, There's a lot of things you you can do uh, that that we don't really think about. We don't think about the, the connectedness, uh, and and so what happens is teachers get locked up in their individual self-contained classrooms, I sometimes call them yes, self-contaminated <laughs> classrooms, and we don't break down the boundaries. Uh, and so the boundedness of schools. And one of the things I think, that, for example, tomorrow morning in this conference we're in, we'll take a, a body of, of, of concepts and frameworks and theories that we bring to this and say, now, hearing what we heard today, what can we learn from what we heard today? Today we heard three people tell us stories, and I don't mean lies, I uh -huh. mean stories that, uh, uh -huh. of their particular department, and we've got a storyline now, uh -huh. and we've got you know, a group of superintendents that have a, a system, a, a common body of story, a common body of lore. Uh -huh. We'll take that back tomorrow morning, and we'll sit down together, and we'll take ideas like knowledge development system, we'll talk about the directional system, we'll ask questions like, how does this organization maintain direction? Uh -huh. how, does, how does a new person coming into this organization catch the direction and know what uh -huh. the Cisco way is? Uh -huh. uh, how, what can we learn about, how, what can Steve take back with him and, and, and what can Annie take back with her about how you maintain direction and, and to establish more powerful direction. And it's that kind of learning, but you've got to have a body of theory and frameworks. And I think if we bring anything to this argument ourselves, we bring a, a series of frameworks, a series of questions that can be put to organizations in general, whether it's a, a well-run business or a poorly run business. Because one of the things you, you, you discover, if you go to enough businesses, there's a lot of mediocre businesses. Mm -hmm. So you're not asking mediocre businesses to teach you lessons. You're saying, what lessons can you learn uh -huh. from a mediocre business so you don't become mediocre? Uh -huh. uh, because mediocrity is produced too. Okay. And so you have, to, you have to think about that. Uh -huh. I want to respond to Phil's point. I think uh, one of the values of being in a network like this, whether it's a standard bearer network or the superintendent's leadership network, uh -huh. and I really saw it today with the way that Cisco approached. They showed us a piece where they, they learned an awful lot about the hospital industry. Uh -huh. And they were out there looking at what was working that their competitors were doing. And they didn't say, well, that's our competitor, so we want no part of it. They said, what can we learn from our competitor so that we can make our product more useful than our competitors for our customer? And one of the things that outside this network we don't do, and maybe even we need to do better in this network, is take the approach in education that what our colleagues are doing we should be paying attention to and building on to serve our customer, which are the students, rather than we can't be competitive with each other. It, it is us in education, the they is, are the challenges in education that are keeping our kids from getting where they need to be. And so it's wonderful to have this network and to learn that even the Cisco's of the world, they take us, if, if they mm -hmm. stopped looking at what made their competitor successful and using what they could, uh, they won't be in business for very long. I think what you're trying to say is that, um, and I want to add to that, is you know we need to learn from everybody, mm -hmm. uh, everybody, the, our peers and uh, others too, our uh, the ones that we may be competing against. Uh, one of the things that I think I, was really significant for me that I learned today, as I looked at the elect using the electronics as we were connected to the young man who was talking to us from Europe, mm -hmm. uh, we do need to become more connected, and it makes me think about Bill's comment that students' attendance mm -hmm. is mandatory, but their attention is volunteer and so one of the connections I see that Cisco will be able to bring to us and then utilizing the engagement piece from Phil is the technology helps us to engage our students now many times we could have the electronic whiteboard as I think <laughs> Phil replied re referred to this morning in one of our meetings or we can actually use it for what it's designed to do and I really began to engage our students in the type of equipment and the type of exposures that they are used to all the time we fail so pitifully to do that we are still operating again in the 19th century when we have 21st century tools. So that's one of the things I'll take back, certainly from uh, the whole session too, is how to use the tools that we have. Cisco has provided many for us. How to use those tools appropriately to help prepare our students to move forward. I think there's another lesson in that yeah. you can take a lot of 
modern technology mm -hmm. and cram it inside the old system. Yes. And it's still the same old system. You're still doing so it you're, the same so way. So you're, you're using the technology to do old work exactly. in old ways, and maybe in new ways as opposed to doing new work. Yeah. And, and so, so what you have to do is transform schools to accommodate the new technology. Mm -hmm. if, we don't, if we don't accommodate the new technology, the new technology gets driven into an old system exactly. and it becomes domesticated. Mm -hmm. It just becomes it, the, 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 you know, the overhead projector yes. uh, is a substitute for the chalkboard and the chalkboard was a substitute for the slate board and each one of them just becomes another extension but it's not a new thing. Let me give you an example of that. I know you're done no, to say no. something but I have to share that it just came to my mind that perfect example a year ago we had all these wonderful Promethean boards in our in one of our 21st century schools and I'd walk in the classroom <laughs> and that's exactly what was happening. It was a glorified white board, marking mm -hmm. board. Now though after the training because teachers have to learn how to use it too and, I, and now after the training I walk into the room the kid is up there moving stuff around and the yeah. teachers and others are doing it so you're right there you have to learn how to use the uh, technology appropriately if not you're just teaching the same dog yep. the same tricks using new equipment to do it I'm actually glad, glad you <laughs> said what you said it leads really well into what I'd like to say in the white paper that we read yes. over the past couple days a chart that grabbed me that really illustrated a lot of what I've heard you talk an awful lot about Phil and what you just said they showed how kids have access to technology mm -hmm. to media to their cell phone mm -hmm. to the yes. to, to the internet and they show that the only times they are disconnected from technology is when they're at school or when they're having a break mm -hmm. from school they go home they're right back at it mm -hmm. and I think it behooves us to be very mm -hmm. careful that instead of trying to compete with that and just say they need technology in those in those gaps that it's all the more uh, important that what we design are engaging experiences that have mm -hmm. the technology mm -hmm. you know Stability. produce profound learning because mm -hmm. if not we're never going to exactly. compete with what they're getting in those peaks mm -hmm. throughout the morning and the evening and the weekend well, I think I think if there's a big lesson for us it's, mm -hmm. it, it's how we have to transform the schools so that they become platforms for learning yes where they've been organized to be platforms for teaching yes so yes. basically basically we've we've, t we've often look at new technologies as a teaching tool. Yes, we do. Uh, and we need to think about it as a learning tool. Mm -hmm. And not only a learning tool for kids, but learning tools for teachers. But if all we think of the, of the technology being as an extension of the teacher, mm -hmm. to make it easier for the teacher to teach, mm -hmm. as opposed to more important for the kids to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, that's a, and that re really requires a transformation of the rules and the roles and the mm -hmm. relationships in schools. Okay. Phil, I heard you this morning in framing this experience for today talk about the difference between design and planning. You talked about the importance of the audience. Mm -hmm. And then we went to Cisco and at Cisco they emphasized the importance of audience. Mm -hmm. And so as we come to a close of this panel presentation, I wonder if we could stay there for a moment and talk about what did we learn from our experience today about the importance of the various audiences that we serve in our public schools. Can I say just I'll be real quick and that is it reinforced for me my latest learning about the the value of pre-design mm -hmm. and the value of instead of waiting until as teachers design work for kids instead of waiting and doing what it, what is a good thing and evaluating whether they're engaged or not and whether the content met their needs the whole value what Cisco talks about is the pre-design and knowing their customer first they don't want to wait until they build something out design it manufacture it sell it then find out 40 percent of the people would not use it mm -hmm. well why would we and what we're doing more and more in, in our school district is we're bringing uh, students into the pre-design they don't design to work mm -hmm. but rather than wait until the end to ask them if they're engaged say based on what we're looking at for this work, what would be more likely to engage you at the outset? And I think that models greatly what Phil talks a lot about and what business has to do. Mm -hmm. And if business has to do it, um, why, why would we not take that approach more and more? Annie? I'll we have to begin to design lessons for the learners, not, again, for them to uh, want to learn. Uh, because the competition uh, with private schools and home schools and uh, virtual schools and charter schools, if public education does not do that, then our, we will lose our customers. So we need to start looking at what the customers need, who are our students, who is the community, what are the needs, the businesses. We have to start looking at our stakeholders and getting information and not just, again, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think Phil used this morning, continuous improvement, uh, improvement plans versus continuous innovation. We have to become innovators now or we will lose our public that's well all there is to it well 
Steve, uh, Phil, a final word on the importance of audience? Of yeah, design. I think I think it's important that we understand. And here's a place where we, I found it necessary to help business to help business help us. From a business person's perspective, when they look at students, because they're talking about a workforce, they tend to think about the student as a product. Mm -hmm. And so they talk about our product. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't think about the student as a product. We've got to think about the student as our customer. We design work for kids. The work we give the kids is our product. And business can help us a lot more if they, when they're thinking with us about mm -hmm. what becomes to them a product, mm -hmm. what has to be to us a customer. And we have to understand, we have to frame the issue about how do we better meet the needs of our customer and students are our customer. When, when business positions itself as our primary customer, and I, I heard a, a, a member of a local business group last week make the statement, business is the prime customer of the schools. Well, that's true, but it's not. Mm -hmm. if, if we don't understand that the student is the prime customer of the school, we can't business is our customer's customer <laughs> and our job is to serve That's our customer in such a way that our customer can serve the needs and interest of business but if business pushes us into the position of thinking about the kid as a customer it not only dehuman or thinking of the kid as a product mm -hmm. it not only dehumanizes the student and therefore okay. makes takes the emotion out of the business but it also puts us in a position where we can't do the job that business wants us to do mm -hmm. Phil, that's a powerful point to conclude our panel presentation today, and I want to thank you very much for participating in this activity. I especially want to thank our two superintendents, uh, Steve and Annie, thank you. Uh, for participating great. in this activity. And then in closing, we want to thank Cisco for providing the opportunity for the production of this video. Good afternoon.